Welcome, one and all, to the Genealogy Radio Show, the show that's keeping you in the loop. For today's episode, we'll be discussing crime and punishment throughout the 19th century. To begin, let's hand over to Nicholas to discuss the, to discuss the court system. Nicholas, with Ireland being so heavily associated with criminalization, what were the different types of court used in the 19th century to punish these crimes, and can you explain a little bit about them, please? First, and maybe most common of all, were the petty court sessions. These had two main purposes. These were there to institutionalize public legal proceedings and where necessary discipline appointed magistrates whose job it may be to watch over poorer classes. These issues and disputes would have been presided over by the justices of the peace. The process of the Petty Sessions Act was complex. Coercion was applied in society by introducing changes to society, changes to class experience and social class. Towns that were not loud, large enough to contain a borough police would instead be policed by the county constabulary where there would be an appointed magistrate put in a position to fulfill administrative functions of furthest town. These county magistrates met either once a week or once every fortnight in what were known as petty sessions. These were assembled to deal with offenders under, under sum, summary jurisdiction acts and to pass punishment where necessary. Magistrates had lost most of their power with the introductions of true democracies, where they used to meet quarterly about all the affairs in the county, Magistrates used to have charge of jails, asylums, county police forces, and main roads. Petty court sessions traditionally dealt predominantly with civil issues and smaller breaches of law, while murders and extreme crimes would have been dealt with by the court of assizes, which I will talk about next. Some, example of petty, some examples of petty court offences include things like public intoxication, swearing, and disturbance of the peace. While being put through the petty court sessions, each individual person had their legal status defined as either free, native born, free by servitude or conditional pardon. The Court of Assizes was the predecessor to the High Court in Ireland and focused primarily on serious crimes such as murder and treason. This court would sit twice a year. The Court of Assizes process would begin with the case going to the petty court sessions and a justice of peace or a registered magistrate would decide if the evidence initially provided warranted a trial. Bills of indictment and evidence provided would then be showcased to a grand jury where it would be decided if there should be a relevant punishment. It wasn't until after the Catholic emancipation in 1829 that Irish Catholics could sit on a grand jury. There were two distinct offices held in the 18th and 19th century. These were the offices of the Crown and the offices of the Peace. These positions were awarded in each county by the Custis Rotulum who was the principal justice of the peace in each county. Eventually, these two positions became amalgamated into one. The role of the clerk of the crown was massively influential in the court system. They held position as secretary to the grand jury for criminal business, as well as tasks with pre preserving all information, examinations of the magistrates, swearing in of the grand jury, arraigning the prisoners, entering the pleas on record and cross-examining witnesses on trial. Another common court was, were the quarter sessions. By the, thir by the 36th Act, third edition, magistrates were commissioned the authority to hold four sessions seasonally, coined the quarter sessions. Here, magistrates ruled over the crimes deemed as severely affecting the public peace. Treasonous acts and felonies were passed up to the court of assizes. The quarter sessions heard rules for good uh, for goods taken for distress, assaults, riots, rescues, and trespasses attended with violence. To finish, I'll discuss a little bit about the general Irish court system at the time and its influences. British sentiment towards Irish people influenced the heavy-handed punishments given to the Irish through courts. In the aftermath of the Great Famine, when emigration was peaking, the wandering Irish had an impact on the crime rates in their host communities, especially in England. The Irish poor were the villains of Victorian society and were strongly represented in the courts and prison populations. British newspaper articles from the mid 19th century read, the government cannot expect to sustain the authority of law in Ireland where the established courts of justice are held in contempt. Trial by jury has been proved a solemn mockery. The early existence of a, of a police force in Ireland in existence by the 19th century the Royal Irish Constabulary and the Dublin Metropolitan Police paid, played an important role in the overall centralization of justice in Ireland. One British newspaper wrote 
that the police acted as gatherers of information on crime and criminal activities and through the office of the county inspectors clerk passed evidence in the form depositions and witness statements taken before magistrates to headquarters in Dublin Castle. Thus, the escape from the clasps of crime in mid 19th century Ireland was extraordinarily difficult. Now I'd like to pass you back to Connor to continue with the show. Thank you, Nicholas. We will now go to Kewen for the types of crimes in the 19th century. So, Kewen, can you tell us what crimes in Ireland during the 19th century were the most common to appear in courts throughout the country? Uh, yes, so crime levels were high in Ireland in the 1800s and assault was the most common crime, while theft also featured heavily in the crime records. Uh, murder was also much more prominent at this time in both Ireland and England, with murder rates in the Victorian era seven times higher than in the present day. Nonviolent crimes such as poaching and public drunkenness and trespassing as well were commonplace in Ireland at this time too. The levels of these crimes increased tremendously during the time of the Industrial Revolution due to sharp increases in population and in the production of desirable goods. According to the CSO census reports, the population in Ireland rose from 6,846,949 in 1821 to 8,175,230 in 1841. As many people profited from the Industrial Revolution and became rich, there were many people becoming increasingly poor and therefore many people envious of others' possessions. This coupled with higher density of people meant that there was more chance that crimes would increase. Evidence of high crime levels in Ireland can be seen in various court records. Serious crimes such as assault and embezzlement repeatedly appeared on the Irish Police Gazette uh, records, known as the Hue and Cry newsletter. The Irish Police Gazette released every Tuesday and Friday to the members of law enforcement detailing the crimes committed, the rewards offered, where the crimes took place, and the names of the offender. Assault, which we have established as one of the most common crimes at the time, is included among the types of crime reported in the Irish Police Gazette. Assault of different variety was common amongst all counties in Ireland and was seen frequently in the newsletter from 1863 onwards. Assault is to physically harm another person and many of the assault charges in the newsletter allude to these assault cases endangering another life. Uh, the 19th century saw an increase in white collar crimes such as embezzlement. Embezzlement refers to, the, to an individual misusing the assets entrusted to them. Incidences of this crime began making frequent appearances in the Irish Police Gazette findings from the 1874 newsletter onwards. The Munster Bank embezzlement is one notable example. During the year of 1885, Munster Bank was shut down due to high debt and unpaid loans from their managers. It was later found that the bank's assisting manager, along with other members of the bank, embezzled thousands of pounds worth of money, causing the eventual downfall of the bank. The assistant manager, Robert uh, Farquharson, disappeared without trace in 1885. Crimes deemed to be of lesser punishment, such as poaching and public drunkenness, were not found too often in the Irish Police Gazette, but instead in the petty court session records. Poaching was common in the 1800s, especially the poaching of fish like salmon. As rural, as rural poverty was preva uh, prevalent at the time, many people turned to poaching just to survive. A popular choice of boat to carry out such poaching was the coracle, a light boat shaped like a bowl made from woven grass or weeds, which was covered in animal hides. This small boat originated in Wales, but was also used in the rest of Britain and Ireland. The flat bottom spread the weight evenly across the structure, reducing the depth of water needed for it to float in to only a few inches. It was also quite small, making it easy to creep up on unsuspecting prey and to transport it undetected to and from the poaching site. In this time, many people made a living from poaching uh, for rabbits and salmon, even though it was illegal. The crime of drunkenness was also a lesser crime that appeared quite often in the petty court sessions. Drunkenness on a public street was com a common crime in the 19th century Ireland. Although not punished as severely now, in the 19th century, drunkenness was apparent in every county and was brought before the petty courts for each incident. Sometimes offenders were sent to prison for being drunk on a public street with a maximum sentence of one year, while other times they were simply fined for their offence. Another crime regularly featured in the petty court session was trespass. In fact, it was so common, 
commonly prosecuted at the time, that there are records in the petty sessions of people taken to court over their animals, such as chickens or geese wandering onto neighboring properties. In this case, the owner of the animal was prosecuted for trespass as the animal itself could not stand trial. The reason for the severity in these cases concerning animals was often the potential danger that the animals posed to the crops on the land, causing damage worth a lot of money to the landowner. Now that I have touched on the common crimes, I'll let Connor introduce you to our next section. Thank you, Kewen. Now that we've covered the crimes, let's cover the punishments with Lucas. Now, Lucas, what are some of the most common punishments for the various crimes committed in 19th century Ireland? Thank you, Connor. Fines. Fines were the most often given punishment, and due to the poverty in Ireland, many people couldn't pay them. These debtors, as they were called, were sent to a debtor's prison for not paying something, being a, be it a loan or a fine, and people would be forced to pay rent in prisons back then. Court-ordered fines were an undeniably corrupt institution, with one-third of the money going to the judge who issued that fine. And if you fail to work off your debt by prison labour, and no one outside bailed you out, the poor would die in these prisons. Which may not have been that long, with hard labour in most prisons, and some had a sort of water wheel, like on a mill, but wide enough for a dozen prisoners to step up on the next rung. It was a means of torture, and the precursor to the modern treadmill, living off bread that was boiled three times. Their last breath could be in a totally dark cell, as the people in charge just did not care. Shame-based punishments like stocks and whippings were declining now, and transportation was more common. When the USA gained independence, people were sent to a brutal prison colony in Australia. I know Australia is a nice place, but these prison colonies were certainly not. Transportation as a punishment ended in 1868, the year the last prison vessel set sail for Australia. Crime had been increasing the whole time through transportation, and Australia was better understood by the poor and no longer this scary enigma. There were normal prisons as well, like Kilmainham Jail, where execution was always front and centre in the minds of everyone who entered the building, as the hangman's gallows was in a balcony right above the main entrance of the prison. In Kilmainham, from 1796 to 1910, 180 hangings took place. That's three hangings every two years in this jail alone. They made the most of them as well, until public execution was banned in 1868. Drinks were sold to adult onlookers, and toffee apples would be bought for the kids. Such a crowd attended these events that pickpocketing was common, and there were reporters as well, noting down any last words of the condemned. Back in 1803, Robert Emmett, United Irishman, for the crime of high treason against the king, by rebellion, or outrage, as it was called, was to be hung, drawn, and quartered. This method was so rare at the time that the executioner actually messed up, though Robert Emmett wouldn't have minded. He was set to be hung, but cut down in time, to be alive when he was dragged through the streets by a horse. Then his arms and legs went. But Lucky Rob got to skip the drawing, and likely rather embarrassed, the executioner started with the quartering with his head. Women were executed as well, rarely, only for serious crimes, such as the two Bridgets, Bridget Butterley and Bridget Ennis, who were hanged in public above the entrance of Kilmainham in 1821 for robbery and murder. Back to you, Connor. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Now, for our final piece, let's go over to Keen to discuss the evolution of crime and punishment. Keen, how would you say crimes and punishment have evolved over time since 19th century Ireland? The role of criminal justice is to provide justice for all citizens under the rule of law. This is done by defining clearly what is and is not criminal behaviour, 
and the punishments for these violations are dished out accordingly proportionate to the severity of the crime. Ireland's criminal justice system from the 19th century onwards went through a series of changes in what it considers punishable offences to the rule of law and what ultimately the role of the justice system should play out in the newly independent Irish Republic. In pre-medieval times, most people were executed or fined. Prisons were a new concept. The criminal class were exported to prison colonies. Once there, prison ships called hulks, which were moored off the coast, hid the criminal class. Then early modern prisons tortured the prisoners in the hopes of reforming them. It was far worse than prisons of this day and age. Prisons today are influenced by the philosophy of Michel Foucault, especially his 1975 book, Punish and Discipline, who implicated his opposition to torture. However, perhaps the most fundamental change in Ireland's history of crime and punishment is the criminal justice system itself. Ireland's criminal justice system has been heavily influenced by England since the introduction of English common law in the 16th century. Ireland from then until the creation of the Irish Free State in 1922 served as a social laboratory for the English with pre-independence Ireland having harsher penal laws for crimes and policies for policing and surveillance than the English were willing to subject on their own people. By the early 20th century, many Western nations began to adopt the rehabilitative ideal into their institutional concepts of crime and punishment, in which the role of punishment for a criminal offence was not just punishment for breaking the law as a way to deter other potential offenders, but a model to reform, rewire, or rehabilitate the offender out of their criminal behavior and reincorporate them into societal norms. Every decade in the 20th cent 19th century witnessed a period of political unrest in Ireland, which was usually followed by a rise in criminal activity. In the 1830s, Robert Peel introduced a number of reforms to the criminal justice system, including reducing the number of capital crimes and changes to the ways people were defended. A capital crime was a crime that was punished by execution. Capital crimes ranged from murders to insurrections, which would have been considered high treason against the King of England. In 1803, Robert Emmett was executed for his role in the 1803 rebellion. In 1848, the Young Ireland Rebellion occurred which was high treason against the King of England. After the famine, the courts and the criminal justice system were more generally reformed. Violent assaults as part of a robbery were quite rare, but recreational violence, such as domestic violence and drunken brawls, made up 42% of all homicides. Today, we watch on in horror at draconian punishments carried out in Saudi Arabia and Iran, but it was only in the 19th century that Ireland had just as draconian laws. In 1850, for example, a mother of two named Margaret Doyle was deported to Tasmania for seven years for stealing a loaf of bread from a limerick shop. Her defence was that her husband was left disabled after a work accident and her children were starving. In those days, the punishment for murder was hanging. A prime case was in 1847 in Broadford, County Clare, at the height of the famine. Three young men named William Ryan Puck, William Ryan Small and Butt Shea murdered a land agent named Watson after he distrained a poor farmer named O'Keefe's farm animals. The three men were hanged, but the worst part of all was that O'Keefe was hanged for being an accessory in the murder, despite not being aware of the three men's intentions when they called to his house. 
I will now hand back over to Connor for the closing statement. That concludes our show for this week. I'd like to thank our presenters, Nicholas, Hewan, Lucas, and Kean on their, for their fantastic work on 19th Century Crime and Punishment. This show will be repeated on Sunday on Radio Cork and Bashkin, and we hope to see you next week for another episode of the show that's keeping you in the loop.